Hey guys, welcome to the session on Kafka Spark Streaming. So let us see the agenda for today. We'll start off by understanding how Kafka came to existence. Then we'll understand what is Apache Kafka. Following which we'll learn about the architecture of Apache Kafka and see how can we set up a Kafka cluster. Going ahead, we'll understand what is Spark and have a look at its various features. After that, we'll see different components of Spark. And at last, we'll implement a demo to integrate Spark streaming with Apache Kafka. So let's understand the need of Kafka. The current day industry generates a lot of real-time data, which needs to be processed in real time. So let me explain this to you with the help of this diagram. These days, organizations have multiple servers at front end and back end, like web or application server for hosting website or application. Now, all of the servers will want to communicate with database server and thus will have multiple data pipelines connecting all of them to the database servers. So you can see that the data pipelines are getting more complex with the increase in number of systems and adding a new system or server requires more data pipelines, which will make the data flow complicated and managing these data pipelines becomes very difficult as each data pipeline has its own set of requirements. So adding some pipelines or removing some pipelines is difficult in such case. So this is where Kafka comes in with all the right answers to the EBA problems. So Kafka basically decouples the pipelines. So as you can see, there is a cluster in the center and then we have consumers which can place a request and there are producers which send messages. So the producers send messages to the cluster from where the consumers can fetch them. So this way, Apache Kafka reduces the complexity of data pipelines and makes communication between systems simpler and manageable. And it is also easy to establish remote communication and send data across a network. So you can establish an asynchronous communication and send messages. Kafka also ensures that the communication is extremely reliable. So now let's understand Apache Kafka in detail. So Apache Kafka is an open source distributed publish subscribe messaging system, which manages and maintains the real time stream of data from different applications, websites, and so on. So Apache Kafka originated at LinkedIn and later became an open source Apache project in 2011. Then in 2012, it became first class Apache project. So Kafka is written in Scala and Java, and it is fast, scalable, durable, fault tolerant, and distributed by design. Now let's understand about various components of Kafka. So we have brokers, which are basically the servers that manage and mediate the conversation between two different systems. Brokers are responsible for the delivery of messages to the right party. Then we have messages which could be of any format such as string, JSON, Avro, and so on. After that, we have topics. In Kafka, all the messages are maintained in what we call topics. These messages are stored, published, and organized in Kafka topics. And then we have clusters. In Apache Kafka, more than one broker, that is, a set of servers is collectively known as Kafka cluster. Now let's look at producers. So producers are the processes that publish the data or messages to one or more topics. So these are basically the source of data stream in Kafka. Then we have consumers. Consumers are the processes that read and process the data from topics by subscribing to one or more topics in the Kafka cluster. And finally, we have partitions. Every broker holds few partitions and each partition can either be a leader or a replica for a topic. All writes and reads to a topic go via the leader and the leader is responsible for updating replicas with new data. If the leader fails, the replica takes over as the new leader. So now it's time to understand about Apache Kafka's architecture. So the producers will send message to a topic at regular intervals. Now brokers store the messages in the partitions configured for that particular topic. And if a producer sends two messages and there exist two partitions, Kafka will store one message in the first partition and the second message in the second partition. Now, consumer always subscribes to a specific topic. On receiving the message, 
consumer sends an acknowledgement to the broker. On receiving the acknowledgement, the offset is changed to the new value and is updated in the zookeeper. Now let's go ahead and check out few interesting facts about the Kafka producer. So producers send records or messages to topics. Producers will also select to which partition a message is to be sent per each topic. The producer could implement priority systems which is based on sending the records to certain partitions depending on the priority of the record. So producers send records to a partition based on the records key. So they don't wait for acknowledgements from the broker and send messages as fast as the broker can handle. Now let's look at brokers. So the cluster typically consists of multiple brokers to maintain load balance. The broker on receiving messages from the producer assigns offsets to them and commits the messages to storage on disk. And the service consumers by responding to fetch requests from partitions. So one broker instance can handle thousands of reads, writes per second and terabytes of messages. So if backup is a point of concern for you, then let me tell you that backups of topic partitions are present in multiple brokers. So if a broker goes down, one of the broker containing the backup partitions would be elected as a leader for the respective partitions. Now let's look at messages. So messages in Kafka are categorized into topics and these topics are broken down into a number of partitions. Reading messages can either be done in order from beginning to end and we can also skip or rewind to any point in partition by providing an offset value. So offset value is nothing but the sequential ID provided to the messages. So these partitions provide redundancy and scalability. So partitions can be hosted on a different server meaning that a single topic can be scaled horizontally across multiple servers, thus enhancing the performance. So the figure over here shows a topic with four partitions, with writes being appended to the end of each partition. Here a record is stored on a partition either by record key if the key is present or by round robin if the key is missing. So here you can see there are multiple brokers and there is a topic which has four partitions. So each partition has its own ID. The ID of a replica is same as the ID of the broker that hosts it. And for each partition, Kafka will elect one broker as the leader. Supposing the replication factor of a topic is set to three, then Kafka will create three identical replicas of each partition and place those replicas on available brokers in the cluster. Now let's look at the working of consumers. So the consumer can subscribe to one or more topics and reads the messages in the order they were produced. It keeps track of the messages it has already consumed by keeping the track of the offset of messages. So messages with same key basically arrive at the same consumer. So the consumers work as part of a consumer group, which is one or more consumers that work together to consume a topic. The group assures that each partition is consumed by only one member. So as the figure shows, there are three consumers in a single group consuming a topic. And two consumers are working on one partition each, while the third consumer is working on two partitions. Now let's look at the Zookeeper. So Zookeeper is an open source Apache project that provides centralized infrastructure and services that enable synchronization across an Apache Hadoop cluster. So developed originally at Yahoo, Zookeeper facilitates synchronization among the process by maintaining a status on Zookeeper servers that stores information in local log files. And the Zookeeper servers are capable of supporting a large Hadoop cluster. So Kafka brokers coordinate with each other using Zookeeper. Producers and consumers are notified by the Zookeeper service about the presence of new broker in the system or about the failure of the broker in the system. So this is why Zookeeper is really important for Kafka. Now let me help you in understanding a single broker setup configuration in Kafka with the help of a demo. So for this demo, you would need to have Java, Kafka and Zookeeper in your system already. So your first step would be to open the terminal and start the Zookeeper and the Kafka broker. So this is the command to start the Zookeeper. Zookeeper server start.sh. 
After that, I'll give the path Kafka config zookeeper dot properties. So we are starting zookeeper now. What I'll do is I'll duplicate the session, and in this new session, I will start Kafka now. And this is the command to start Kafka. Kafka server start dot sh, and this is the path Kafka config server dot properties. I'll hit on enter, and we are starting Kafka now. Now I'll open another terminal. Now let me type GPS to check if Kafka and Zookeeper are running or not. Right, so Kurumpio means so this tells us that Zookeeper has started and Kafka tells us that Kafka has also started. All right. So now since we have started Kafka and Zookeeper, it's time to create the Kafka topic. So this is the command to create Kafka topic. Kafka topics dot sh and then we'll give double hyphen and given the command create. After that, we'll type zookeeper and given the port number over here, local host two one eight one, and then we'll set the replication factor which is one. After that, we'll give the number of partitions which is one, and then we'll give topic and give the name of the topic. So I am setting the name of the topic to be my topic one. Right, so we see that we have successfully created the topic, my topic one. So now it's time to start the producer to send some messages. And this is the command to start the producer: Kafka console producer dot sh. We'll give double hyphen broker list, and then we'll set the local host and given the port number. After that, we'll give topic and give the name of the topic, which is my topic one. I'll hit on enter, and over here we can give the set of messages. So let me just type hi. How are you? Right. Again, I'll duplicate the session, and this is the command to start the consumer. Kafka console consumer dot sh bootstrap server local host, and then I'll give the port number after that topic, and give the name of the topic, and then type from beginning. I'll hit on enter. Right. So we see that the messages which we had sent from the producer, we get them in the consumer. Now let's say I type something else over here. Sparta, hello world. Now let me open the consumer and see. Right, so Sparta, hello world. Let me write some more messages through the producer. So I'll just type some random words over here. Random words, and again we see that we've got those messages in the consumer. Now let us understand about Spark briefly. So Spark is a cluster computing framework for real-time processing. It was introduced as Hadoop sub project in the UC Berkeley R&D lab in the year 2009 and became open source in 2010 and was finally donated to Apache Software Foundation in the year 2013. So Spark provides an interface for programming all the clusters with implicit data parallelism and fault tolerance. Now let us look at some of the features of Spark. So uh, Spark provides real-time computation and low latency because of in-memory computation. And Spark is 100 times faster for large-scale data processing. And Spark is also polyglot. So you can write Spark applications in multiple languages such as Java, Scala, Python, R and SQL. Spark also has powerful caching. So it has simple programming layer which provides powerful caching and disk persistence capabilities. And Spark also provides multiple deployment modes. So it can be deployed through Mesos, Hadoop via Yarn, or Spark's own cluster manager. Now Spark's impact was such that from small startups to Fortune 500s, almost every single company started adopting Apache Spark to build, scale, and innovate their big data applications. Industries like media, healthcare, finance, e-commerce, and travel—almost every single industry is using Spark intensively. So now let us go ahead and understand the concepts of RDDs in Spark. So when it comes to processing the data over multiple jobs, we need to reuse and share the data, which can be achieved through in-memory data sharing, which is actually faster than network and disk sharing. This is where. RDDs come in to help us with in-memory data sharing. So RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset, 
and it is the fundamental data structure of Apache Spark. So by resilient, I mean fault tolerant as it can recompute missing or damaged partitions in case of a node failure with the help of RDD lineage graph. And it is distributed since data resides on multiple nodes. And finally, dataset represents records of the data you work with. So the user can load the dataset externally, which can be either JSON file, CSV file, text file, or a database. So now, let us understand the various components of Spark ecosystem. Let me start with Spark core component, which is the most vital component of Spark ecosystem. It is responsible for basic IO functions, scheduling, monitoring, and so on. So you can say that the entire Spark ecosystem is built on top of it. Then we have different deployment modes. So Spark can be deployed through Hadoop Yarn, Mesos, or Spark's own cluster manager. Then we have different libraries. So the Spark ecosystem library is composed of Spark SQL, MLF, GraphX, and Streaming. So Spark SQL helps us in performing queries on data and store data using SQL-like queries. Then we have MLLib. The Spark machine learning library eases the deployment and development of scalable machine learning pipelines like summary statistics, correlation, feature extraction, and many others. And GraphX component of Spark helps the data scientists to work with graphs and non-graph sources to achieve flexibility and resilience in graph construction and transformation. Then we finally have the Spark streaming component, which allows us to perform batch processing and streaming of data in the applications. Coming to the programming languages, Spark can be implemented in Scala, R, Python, and Java. However, Scala is the widely used language for Spark. And finally, we can store data over HDFS, local file system, and cloud. It also supports SQL and NoSQL databases. So now you might have got a brief idea about Spark components. But let us discuss streaming in detail as we'll be performing a demo on Kafka Spark streaming towards the end of our session. So data streaming is a technique for transferring data so that it can be processed as a steady and continuous stream. A data stream is an unbounded sequence of data arriving continuously. There are so many users out there using various streaming sources like YouTube, Netflix, Facebook, and Twitter. And all these sources produce live streams of data. Thus, streaming technologies are becoming increasingly important with the growth of the internet. So Spark streaming is used for processing real-time streaming data. It enables high throughput and fault-tolerant stream processing of live data streams. And with Spark streaming, we can perform RDD transformations on mini batches of data. So the fundamental stream unit here is known as DStream, which is basically a series of RDDs to process the real-time data. So now that you understood what exactly Spark streaming is, let's have a look at some of the features of Spark streaming. So Spark streaming is scalable. Let's say you start processing with a single node, but then with the increase of data, you can add more nodes as and when required. Spark streaming is also very fast and helps in achieving low latency. Another feature of Spark streaming is that it provides fault tolerance. That is, if there is any failure or error during streaming process, it can be handled without any loss of data. Spark streaming can be easily integrated with both batch processing and real-time processing. So now let me brief you about how Spark streaming works. So as you can see here in the diagram, Spark streaming receives live input data streams from various sources. It divides the data into multiple batches, which are then processed by the Spark engine and generates the final stream of results in batches. So now we'll implement a demo on how to integrate Kafka with Spark streaming. So in this demo, we are going to fetch data from Kafka topic to our Spark app. So let me actually show you guys the folder where our Spark application is present. So I have created a folder with the name Kafka Spark Streaming and the entire Spark application would be in this folder. So let me hit LS and let's see what do we have. So we have build.sbt over here, which basically has all the dependencies to run the code and build the jar file. And inside this SRC folder, we've got the code file for the Spark application. So let me go into this SRC folder. 
I'll hit ls. So inside this, we have the main folder. Again, let me go inside that. CD main. And inside the main folder, we have the Scala folder. So I'll go inside that too. CD Scala. And inside this, we finally have our Scala program, Kafka R dot Scala. So let me open it. VI Kafka R dot Scala. So this is our program for the Spark application, right? And over here in the program, if you can see, I have given the name of the topic to be my test. So later on, when I'm creating a topic, I would have to name the topic to be my test. So now that we've uh, seen this folder, which has all the Spark code, let me go ahead and start Zookeeper and Kafka. So now let me put in the command to start Zookeeper. So it will be Zookeeper server so start.sh and then I'll give the path kafka slash config slash zookeeper dot properties. So we are starting Zookeeper now. I'll duplicate the session and I'll also start Kafka. So this will be the command to start Kafka. Kafka server start.sh and this is the path kafka slash config slash server dot properties. I'll hit enter and we see that Kafka is also starting. Now again, let me duplicate the session. So let me type GPS to see if Kafka and Zookeeper have started or not. Right, so we see that Quorum Peer main, this tells us that Zookeeper has started and we have Kafka over here, which tells us that Kafka also has started. So now it's time to create a topic with the same name which we had provided in the program. Right, so this is the command to create the topic. Kafka topics.sh. I'll give the create command and then I'll type zookeeper. After that, I'll give localhost and then set the port number. And then I'll give the replication factor, which is one. After that, I'll give the number of partitions, which is also one. After that, I'll type topic and give the name of the topic, which is my test. So we have successfully created this topic, my test. Now it's time to create the producer to pass on some messages. And this is the command to start the producer Kafka console producer.sh broker list and then we'll type localhost and give the port number. Of that, we'll type topic and give the name of the topic, which is my test. All right, so we have also started the producer and then we can start giving in the messages. Hi, how are you? So now what I'll do is I'll create a duplicate session and in that duplicate session, I will compile and run the Spark session. So let me go to the Kafka Spark streaming directory, cd Kafka Spark streaming. So let me see what do we have over here. So we have the build.sbt file, libmanage and the src file. So now I'll compile the sbt file. So let me just type sbt compile. Right, so we see that done compiling. This means that we have successfully compiled the .sbt file. Now let's also run this. Let me give in the command sbt run. Okay, so we have successfully started this session. So now what I'll do is I'll pass in some messages through the producer and we'll get all of those messages in the Spark session with real time over here. Right, so Sparta this is Sparta, right? So we see that these messages which I'm sending through the producer, we get this in the Spark session over here. Sparta, this is Sparta. Again, let me also send some random messages. Right, so we get all of these random message one, two, and three over here. So uh, this is Spark Kafka integration. And we get this in the session over here. This is Spark Kafka integration. Right, guys, so this is how we can integrate Spark with Kafka. And guys, this brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much for watching the video.